All right, hello everyone and welcome to Math or Days. Math's so fun, we do it on Saturdays. My name is Teresa Wills. I'm an assistant professor at a George Mason University in the Mathematics Education Leadership Program. Um, I've been teaching online now for a decade. I really like teaching online, but part of it is because I've had the time to develop strategies that work well, that give students voice, um, and actually lets you hear uh, all of your students. So today you're gonna experience a one hour math block where we start off with some community building, we go into a math routine, and then we go into a rich task where we use Smith and Stein's five practices to discuss the mathematics that comes out of it. And I hope that you can use this in your classroom as well. Um, so to get started, you are going to need uh, access to the interactive slides. I'm going to go ahead and put that link in the chat box now if you don't already have it open. And if you're new to us, welcome. We have quite a few people who come pretty regularly. So there's uh, folks who know kind of the ins and out of the technology. They are very kind and patient and will support anyone who has techie questions. Um, I'm also uh, happy to help out with any techie questions that people might have. Um, so let's just see where we are, where we're coming from, what, um, what we're celebrating. Uh, and to do that, we're going to move down to slides three, four, or five. Uh, and you can add a text box. You can tell us how it's going. Uh, you can add images if you like, animated GIFs and more. Um, but again, you'll need to click on the link to the slides to be able to edit them. And then you will write directly on slides three, four, or five. And I'll ask a couple of us to turn on their microphones and share out loud just kind of how it's going um, and elaborate a little bit on um, the things that they've written. So I'd love to start on slide five. Someone's got this great little graph. Um, tell us what your graph is about, where you did it. Is this something that you did, your students did, um, and what does it describe? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Okay, good. This is Jerry. I'm um, from Washington State. I work with um, I work with fifth graders, and we use Desmos. And um, but the the task was the opening task was just to draw a sketch of your energy level, and then this was just a blast to see how were you feeling two weeks ago all the way to today. <laughs> so we did this yesterday. It was very fun to see all their different graphs. Very cool. I love bringing graphs in with like our personal sides of it. How fun. We've got others coming on here. Um, I've got a photo from uh, Happy New Year's. My kiddos stayed up till midnight. Um, someone wrote, first week of 2021 is over and it went well. Can I ask you what about it went so well? What advice do you have for other people or what was your favorite part? Oh, and I see that person's writing in perfect. Uh, someone already had a formal observation. Wow. Um, how did it go? Uh, tell us a little bit about how your first week back went. Hi, this is Stephanie. Um, so yeah, so I had a formal observation with my principal. We ended up learning about um, oh my gosh, I don't even remember at this point. This week's been crazy. Um, it was nonfiction and using the text features, um, and it was a very authentic conversation. Kids were asking questions all about koalas, um, and it was. I'm really glad that it went well because it was also on my birthday, <laughs> so I'm glad that that went um, well as well. Wonderful. Well, um, so glad that you had some authentic uh, stuff come out in your formal observation. Yay! Congrats. Laura, tell us about, I love this movie, Ratatouille. Um, tell us about, it, it's on TikTok musical. I don't know about that. Um, so, buenos dias, Teresa. Happy New Year, guys. Um, I love Disney and I love musicals. Like, I'm a huge musical theater nerd. And um, a couple months ago, some people in quarantine um, started writing uh, Ratatouille, the TikTok musical. 
Um, and then some Broadway folks decided to like turn it into a real thing. Um, so they did it as a fundraiser um, for Broadway Cares, and I bought tickets and streamed it, and it's the most amazing thing in the world. I could talk about it all day, but they're going to do an encore tomorrow. Ooh, I might have to open that up and, and watch it with my kiddos. We, uh, is it kid-friendly? Is it like... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I watched it with my, I, uh, the streaming expired, like it went until Monday. So the first day back, I watched it with a couple kids during Lunch Bunch. It's absolutely kid friendly. Awesome. I, um, it, this is a favorite in our household. So thanks for sharing. All right, we've got some other ones, all of our lovely ones in here. And, um, on slide three, there's some little blue circles. I'd love to hear about what's happening here. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Oh. Oh, there you are. Hi. Sorry. It's T. Hi, T. Um, I, made, I made this little uh, Jamboard assessment for kindergarten. Um, and so it's really easy for kids to show five circles by moving the circles into the box. And um, great fun and really excited to see um, teachers use it. That's lovely. And you know what, T, what I really like about this is the connection between not only mathematics, but the computer, that the hand-eye coordination that we all know is so important for kindergartners, but the implementation of the computer side of it also. What a great activity. All right, folks, um, let's jump right into our math routine. Um, I am on slide six. Uh, this math routine is called Same But Different. Uh, I've got this from Sue Looney. And um, what we're going to do is the activity, but uh, kind of a little bit of a twist to it to make it online friendly. If you want some links, so you don't, you don't have to create these. You can just get them right off the website. There's a bunch of them there, which is a fabulous resource. Um, you can go ahead and click on those links. And the activity we're going to do is um, just through um, the teleconferencing tool. So you're just going to be in Collaborate or, you know, if you use Zoom or whatever else it is, and you're going to use the chat box. Um, I'm going to, as the instructor, take care of all the writing on the screen, and you all are going to write in the chat box. And on slide seven is where I am, but you can just observe and collaborate. These two images are up here. And I'm curious if you see something that is the same about them or if you see something that is different about them. And we're going to do something called a chat waterfall, which means that we all have a really nice amount of wait time to type in the chat. And then at the same time, we all hit enter. Now, during that time, you could type in same and whatever you thought was the same, or you could write different and whatever it is, it sometimes is useful to begin by writing same or different, but sometimes they're both in the same. Either one works. So take a moment in the chat box. What do you notice that is the same but different in these two images? And don't hit enter yet. Just type it in and hold on to that thought. All right, go ahead and hit enter when you're ready. And what we're going to see is this kind of flood in of lots of responses. Now, this is particularly nice for students who might be 
nervous to have a voice in your class because they have the opportunity to kind of get lost in the crowd at the same time as accountability for their thinking. So you can, you know, take a record of this, you can see what each student's writing, but they're not really the center of attention. So that's one of the reasons I like using this strategy. Um, and right now what I'm going to do is the instructor is review some of these and select certain ones for people to discuss even further. Um, and um, I wanted to start off with uh, Stephanie, you mentioned this idea of one fourth. Um, I'm going to put it here in our box. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you see this? You said the same. The first one has one fourth blocked off or the white piece shows one fourth missing. The number line is representing one fourth. How do you see that here? So I noticed in the the pie circle that there's these two little black lines that create kind of like a pizza uh, a pizza piece and so I was like originally I noticed that the there was a white piece missing but then I looked closer and I noticed that there was um, those two black lines and so I know that there's four in a fraction that there's four pieces um, so that's our denominator for for fourths um, so I noticed that it's one out of the four pieces are either blocked off or white and then for the second one the it's kind of hard to see but it, it's it's showing from zero to one fourth with the little blocks i guess that's what they are i'm hearing one fourth in both of those wonderful thanks for sharing and um i do want to grab a couple others naomi you mentioned they both show less than one i'd love to hear a little bit about how you saw this I needed to put my mic on um, because if they were to show one hole, the entire circle would be full. And if it were to show one hole on the number line, that little bar would stretch from zero all the way to one. And in both cases, that doesn't happen. So I know that less than one is being either shaded in the circle or not shaded. In both cases in the circle, you could see less than one. And then in the number line, you can see less than one because of the, the, um, the one fourth. Neat. That is a really cool observation that, that, that they both have something in common here. We can now see the whole if you um, looked at that kind of blue notation. Um, T, tell us, uh, you mentioned something very similar to Stephanie. Um, can you tell us what you noticed? I noticed that in the um, circle, one fourth is not shaded, but in the number line, one fourth is shaded. So you're, it's like a mirror image. In the first one, you, you might look at three fourths first because it's the shaded part. And in the second bottom one, you'll, you might look at one fourth first because it is, it's shaded. And so they, they both show one fourth and they both show three fourths. Neat. So in the way you describe the difference, you're actually bringing out a similarity um, that, yeah. that, that there's the, the null <laughs> space, the not space, the empty space. Very cool. Um, Lisa, you mentioned something about the, uh, the images that are used. Tell us about what you know about modeling. Um. I know that you can model in many different ways. For example, our first one is a fraction, a uh, circular fraction. That same model could have done been done in a, a rectangular fashion and cut in four pieces as well. And then I think as we move up in our thinking, we go from more the visual model to the number line model. So we can see that one fourth also on the number line. Lovely. And um, Annalise, I see that you mention um, equal sized pieces. Can you tell us why that is important and how are those the same in these images? So, yeah, so the foundational piece of fractions is they have to be equal sized pieces. It's just not a matter of counting the number of pieces and then the number in all, because very often we can give a, sh a uh, shape to kids that's partitioned in not equal pieces and they still think it's a fraction because they count the number of pieces shaded and the pieces and all. So I'm always looking to make sure it's equally partitioned. <laughs> and so here with that area model, um, 
having those four equal size pieces. And I did see it. You know, typically, we ask kids about the shading part um, as opposed to the unshading, but um, it could be re representing one fourth as well if we asked how what portion is not shaded. Um, but then I do see it as that, that flip where the in the, the circle, we've got three fourths shaded. And in the second one, the number line, we have one fourth represented that distance on the number line. Very cool. Um, yeah, so, you know, we do have these different ways of seeing it. And one thing, I don't know about you all, but my students, when I first talk about number lines, there is this discussion about do we count the tick marks or do we count the space in between? And so one thing that I think is really important here is the connection that we make between there are four pieces of that pie. There are five tick marks, but four spaces on the number line um, and kind of bringing that out regularly in our discussion um, to see that that partition. Yes. Um, there was one other thing that I was prepared to discuss, but I, I didn't see it in uh, our chats, and that was the idea of this piece kind of finishes, the, the bottom piece finishes the top piece. If I had done two of the same representations, two pies, for example, I think a lot of kids see that like, yes, you can fit this piece in. Um, it's like a puzzle piece. But when we have different representations, that's not always as obvious that that one fourth fits into the missing part there, um, which is always a neat one to, to discuss if they can work flexibly in seeing those. Um, and then, uh, so just as a, a heads up, I'd love to hear if one of your same or difference were mentioned today, would you go ahead and put an emoji in the chat box? I want to see who felt like they were seen and heard today. And typically when I do this routine, I actually ask students to put the emojis in while we're talking, like just to keep them engaged, keep them understanding when their thought was said, maybe just said differently. Um, forgot to do it this time around, but glad to see that there are lots of voices heard. Um, so this comes out of the uh, same but different routine. I'm on slide nine. Um, I would love to give a shout out here to Sue Looney, who is with us uh, today, and um, also that you um, you know have an opportunity to join in this raffle giveaway. The link is there on slide nine. Um, Sue, thanks for making this uh, strategy so openly available to everyone and lots of great resources. Um, hope I did it justice and just wanted to give you a, a quick shout out uh, also. Um, thank you so much for taking this routine and making it usable for us online. I'm so excited and thrilled. And um, what you just outlined there was just absolutely brilliant and made me think about young children as well as older children. So thank you for showcasing it. And um, I hope people will definitely take advantage of the images that are just all there for you to grab, regardless of the content area that you're looking for. Thanks so much. And feel free to uh, click that link in, in for that raffle there. All right, folks, now we're going to get into the meat of the day. We've done our little routine. We're ready to jump into our rich tasks. I'm on slide 11. One thing I like to always ground rich tasks in is the research behind it. This isn't just a fun thing to do. Um, according to NCTM, uh, these are the eight math teaching practices. And when you do rich tasks, all eight show up front and center in your uh, in your instruction. And before we actually do our problem, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do the problem solving oath. All you'll do here is read this along with me. If you agree and you want to make this oath today, you'll type your name in the chat box. It says, I, Teresa, promise to try my best. I will make sense of patterns and numbers. I will use manipulatives and drawings. I will make mistakes. I will ask questions. I will listen to other ideas. I will stay engaged by always trying to find another solution or representation. I am a problem solver. I make the world a better place. And it is exciting to see how many people are taking this oath today. So here is our task. It's called not quite a half. And I had a little bit of fun um, 
creating this. My son's birthday was in December and they were cutting the cake for the first time and cutting slices that were way too big. So here is our task on slide 13. It's Saeed's birthday and he's very excited to eat his birthday cake. He wants to eat it all, but his mother says, if you eat it all, you will be sick. Saeed asks, how much can I have? And his mother says, just be sure to leave more than a half. So Saeed cuts a slice um, that is less than a half of the cake. What fraction could he have cut? Show it in a visual model. There are several models that I think would work quite nicely for this, and they're on slide 14. These are not the only manipulatives that you can use. They are just a starting point of things that I looked at ahead of time. I'm going to place you in breakout rooms where you are going to fill your slide with lots of different representations. You'll even notice um, when you get to your group slides that there are follow-up questions kind of hidden behind a little reveal me later screen. Um, and that's to support you in investigating and not going too fast, but also giving you a chance to explore this problem even more. So I'm gonna place you in breakout rooms now. This is automatic in this programming uh, tool. You'll automatically go there. Um, I'll pop in just to make sure people know what slide to go on. Group one will write on slide 15, group two on slide 16, and so on. So let's get mathematizing. Here we go. Hi folks, just checking in with you, letting you know that you are uh, group five and that's on slide 19 is where you'll put lots and lots of representations. Yeah. And outside Chicago, this is the first sun we've had in ages. Oh, lovely. Great. Um, maybe, maybe Chicago's weather's coming my way. All right, so we're we're supposed to pick our slide. What group number are we? We're on. We're group four, so we're slide eighteen. Thank you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Less than a half. Sounds like a limit to me. Uh, Glenn, really did I hear for... you talking about limits in a fourth or fifth uh, no. grade class? <laughs> no. Way to go. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, the, when kids ask me, you know, why do we use a circle when we're doing inequalities? And this is, you know, these are seventh graders. You know, I say, well, let's get real, real. Let's get in the, in the Massachusetts vernacular. I say, let's get wicked close, but not touch it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get as close as you want. Just don't touch it. So, Glenn, so I say, encourage you to actually use that very first manipulative um, with these circles. Have fun yeah, uh, right, solving right. it the way you think kids would. But I will tell you, you can make the divisions of these uh, segments very, very tiny. Yeah. I really like the Cuisinart circles. I thought that's so cool. I'm really excited yeah. to share that with my students. We're doing fractions right now. Oh, my gosh. So cool. Nice. I only recently heard about Cuisinart circles. I'm a huge Cuisinart rod fan, but I've never seen the Cuisinart circles before. That just so appeared Andrew on my horizon Fenner this just, week. Just released this um, within the last couple of weeks. He's the one who does number shapes. Um, he's had a lot of things up on Twitter recently, and he's a web developer for Knowledge Hook, who like takes our ideas yep. that we want for manipulatives and turns them into apps. Wow, that's nice. amazing. Nice. Uh, FYI, I bought uh, Knowledge Hook uh, for one of my classes. They love it. They're begging me to use it all the time. Oh, fun. Okay, let's get a, how many parts? I don't... The scale, different. I don't know. Um, okay, I dropped the circle now, and the circle did stay less than one, 
less than one whole. Oh. The triangle did not. Okay. And I can, oh, but now once I start, no, once I start moving it, it goes on a line. So. I would say he cut five pieces and he has to do cuts a slice that's less than him. So okay. yeah, I don't I don't get how it's pouring itself in. Is that happening? Which um manipulative are you trying? It's an erotic colors it's like then one, two, three, four, five. I got one, two, three, four. I got five pieces, but why is it going in like three fifths and then a little bit more? I'm not sure. Could you, you can you share your screen or do a screenshot to show us? Uh, yeah, one second. Okay, here we go. Oh, that's going to happen. Yeah, I'm not. Okay. Oh, group one, I love how you're using that negative space to describe Saeed's piece. Yeah, I was thinking like it made me think about the warm up, the same but different. <laughs> And then once you've uh, got some initial representation on the left-hand side, oops, Julia, I'm going to actually just mute your mic real quick. It looks like we're getting a lot of feedback on there. Um, once you get that initial, um, if you move those little screens, there's actually follow-ups for this that you can use. Oh, is there for the third one too? Um. It says in the part three. It says something about part three. Oh, whoa, oh. wait a minute. It, it disappeared. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I didn't put that there. Oh, I totally did a mistake. Let me get that for y'all. Okay. And in this, in the Cuisinath, I don't understand how. Oops. That, wow. Are you doing oh. the Cuisinath? Which of the Cuisinaths are you doing? Are you doing the Cuisinaths? How is it connected to the number line? I mean, it breaks it up into their parts, but wait, how is the shading decided? Are you doing the Cuisinaire, the, the Cuisinaire circles? Yeah, how is the shading decided? Oh, I don't know. I haven't clicked on that minute. I did the fraction circles, the first manipulative. I haven't tried the Cuisinaire circles yet. Yeah, I just so. did it because I've never seen it before. Mm hmm. Um. And then the zooming number. Yeah, whatever. All right, folks. Uh, I have just added the part two and three. I had a little mess up there. I didn't include it. So it's on your screen now. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a look. You guys want to wanna click on it and test and what see what's... Left the, uh, what fashion could we have cut? Okay. Hmm. So it's interesting. I don't know. I guess uh, using the um, all right, whatever. Hi, Julia. Um, you are in group one. I'm sorry about the confusion. It looked like there were multiple um logins. Hopefully, we've got this squared away now, though. Okay, I was in group five before, but I can Oh, continue. let me put you in group five then. I want to make sure you're you're with your group. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Usually the opening chat oh, oh. just yeah, it just kind okay. of connected to the, the, you know, get you thinking um, yep. and get you, you know, I guess you get us started. I wanna, yeah. I mean, there's just so many answers to that question and all those tools. I like the choice of tools for kids. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. And then she's got these tasks on the side. So that's almost like a, a, a differentiation piece, right? So if you finish that task, you, these are further things to think about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, guess I, was, I guess I was thinking about posing the question 
Um, so how, how many fractions are there less than a half, which is, which is obviously infinite, but I, d I don't think that's obvious to. No, it's to, a great conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The circle that is on the right of our slide, who put the uh, fraction circle in? I didn't. I, I put know. in two fifths. Which one? Yeah, the circle fraction. Yeah, that's yep. really nice for that last question then. Or actually the fourth question, organize and show slices in order from least to greatest. Can we, let's see. Oh, use that. that's a great idea. Yeah, that's a nice idea. So I can't see the um, chips anymore. Let me slide down to what fraction that one is. All right. So the red and um, I love using the two color counters also to teach like ratio for, mm -hmm. for middle school kids. So now where's your intent, um, the fraction that's yellow, because otherwise if we did the fraction that's red, that would be greater than one half, right? So that's one six. Are you on slide 19? I think we got bumped down to We got bumped. Um, somebody added a slide in there. Yeah, oh! That's, that's I, yeah, I so know. just see. If we run out of room, we can just add a slide, yeah. Yeah. But I see what you're talking about. I think we're down on 20 now, actually. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Oh yeah, so, so what funny. would be the easiest? Okay. That, was, that was the one I was looking at. Okay, so we're going to order these. What would be the easiest way? Well, can I, that geo board one takes some thinking. I haven't figured out what fraction amount that is. I see that it's less than a half, but how much it actually is, do we know? Is it possible I, to tell? I'm not sure. of, I think it's possible because it'd be one little triangle size. Piece. Move it over Let's a little see. bit if that's okay. Do you all mind? I'm just sliding so to get it away. Okay. Wouldn't that be right. like... Um, Right. We get how many points? It'd be seven and a half out of 16. Is that what it is? You counted all the holes. So seven and seven well, and a half. 16, 16 squares and it'd be 17 and okay. a half. Seven. I mean, seven and a half out of 16. I don't know if that's oh, the easiest so way, very, but it's so like that point four six big. eight. That's the decimal points. Four, six, eight, seven, five. That's pretty close, but where'd our other one go? Yeah. I like it. I mean, I think, like, like I said, I'm allowed to do breakouts. I don't, now that I got comfortable with it, I'm, I think it would be really hard not to have them. I have, my fourth graders will go into breakouts together and like help each other through technology issues. If someone's having a tech issue, um, a, a kid will volunteer to help them. They'll go into a breakout, and I can keep teaching. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. awesome. Like, I don't know how I'm, – I'm not trying to be mean or, like, rub it in. I just I, – like, I was afraid to do it, but then once I did it, I'm like, I, I don't know how I could go back. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you use um, Blackboard or Google? Zoom. Yeah, we use Zoom as well. Okay. Debbie, well, I added a number line. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I added a number know. line if people want to move their stuff. It's kind of hard. Maybe we can do a line to connect it one of where it would go.
Yeah, and then interesting, so the generalizations is that we're noticing that the numerator is always less than half of the denominator. Hi, group. Who just said that? And can you rephrase that for me? I need to get that uh, typed down. So a generalization here is that all of the numerators that are a correct answer are less than half of the denominator. Very cool. Naomi, I'm going to ask you when we come together in a whole group um, to uh, state that same thing. And then what I'd like to do is have other people try to find representations that show your statement. Um, so all I'll ask you to do is just kind of restate it. And I'll have the text there also if you want to read directly. Um, but that is a really neat observation that you made. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important thing for kids to understand about fractions. Especially if you're benchmark using benchmarks. Yep. So um, have you guys had the opportunity to think about those other questions on the side? Um, what if you made like an even bigger, oh, I see it, bigger and bigger and bigger yeah. slice. Yeah, yep. we, we were, that's what we were talking about. We're noticing like the progression of like how he would go from a fourth, like if that was our starting piece, like what the bigger pieces would be and what that progression would look like. Yeah. And the there's and he takes up more area. There's more area covered every time mm -hmm. we don't understand so actually, how to use the Cuisinaire one though. You know that's Those a that brand new one that Andrew Fenner um created. He is a programmer for Knowledge Hook, uh, and he also does oh, knowledgeshapes.com. Um, and so yeah, we were a really hard. Stand. We were just kind of exploring it um, and how it might relate to this problem. Um, and then we're kind of kind of go back to the drawing board with the app. Um, but he's an app developer. And I love that all we have to do as a math community is have an idea. And he's like, OK, I can program this. Um, so definitely bring your thoughts and ideas about it uh, back and we can uh, chat with him. But I, I find that his manipulatives are brilliant, I have to tell you. But I find them very difficult to use. I mean, I, I like he, he taps into really important math ideas that you want to dig into, but I find using them really difficult mm, to okay. understand how to use them. I love what he offers in them and the thinking, but I, I, I find really hard figuring out how to use them. I wish he would do like a mini course on how to use his manipulatives. Yeah, I think that was one of the suggestions that came out. I'll definitely let him know that that's like people want it. And is, does he have a page that explains how to use this? Like, I love that the, the number line, but it's so hard to use. Like, you, you need some sort of guidance. It's not as intuitive, you know, to the to a new user. Um, I'm not sure. I'll ask him, though. I'm sure he'd be interested in uh, making it. I mean, I would find it helpful because I, I like his his manipulatives. I think they're really, really, really good. I mean, really good ideas that he has embedded in them that you could use. But like I said, I fool around with them and I don't feel confident that I understand how to use them. OK, thanks for letting us know. And I'll, I'll definitely bring that back. Mm -hmm. OK, we're going back to the big room. In just a minute, I'm almost done gathering all my my pieces. Okay.
I Welcome can... back, everyone, to the main room. We are all back together now. Hello and welcome back. I've went ahead and muted your microphones um, just so we're not all talking on top of each other. Um, and the next part of this activity is the discussion. And this is something that is near and dear to many math teachers' hearts. Um, it's near and dear to mine. And I use the five practices, which is on slide 23, to kind of structure how I do the math talks. Um, before this session even started, I thought of lots of different ways to tackle this problem, and I thought about the technology that could be used to tackle this problem. Um, you probably heard me in and out of your breakout rooms as I was monitoring. Um, oftentimes, I am really there to like steal people's work in a sense. I'm, I'm there to kind of select like, ooh, which are the really good nuggets that are going to build a rich conversation? And the idea around it is that I'm not going to call on every single group, every single person. Um, I will kind of keep a record of that to make sure that I have, you know, um, chances for everyone to, to chat. But in our discussion, it's going to focus more around the math content. So I've selected and sequenced a couple of representations, and now we're going to connect those together and then have people present theirs, but also make some connections. So let's see how that works out. I'm on slide 24, and I've color-coded four different representations that I saw um, as people were looking at Saeed's cake, or in one group they were talking about, let's just think of it as cupcakes because it's easier to divide things in half if we thought of cupcakes. Um, so if you are the uh, creators of the red and the orange, the first two up there, would you tell us what does this representation help us to discover? Laura, I see your microphone is on. Did you want to share with us? I think this came out of your group. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so this is group one, and we were looking at um, the pieces. The white piece is Saeed's piece because that's the piece that he ate. So the piece that's left is what's shaded in. And we were thinking about... Um, different equivalencies or different ways that we could show like he's eating less than half and still leaving more than half on his piece of the cake. Neat. So like our, our warm-up today, we're looking at that negative space, that white space. Awesome. And group five has the yellow one. Um, group five, would you tell us what is, uh, what does this representation show us, the yellow one? I think I did that one. I'm not sure, but what I was thinking about was how I could maximize um, to get as close to a half as possible without actually eating a half. So I was just playing around with looking at models and uh, filling in as close as I could. So it was typically one less than the amount needed to get to a half. Ah, okay. And so you were looking at it with this one big bar model. Yeah, because I, uh, I was trying to use a different circular model, but I wasn't sure how to use the technology and I couldn't figure it out quickly. So I switched to this. Yeah, this is this is fantastic. Um, and then there was somebody, I think this was also group five, who did the cupcake model. I'm not sure if your group was the one who thought of cupcakes or not, but um, could you tell us what fraction you have represented in the blue model there? Uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking about the cupcakes, but that could totally work, and that would be a good visual representation. But it's kind of the same. I was having trouble with some of the other um, manipulatives, so I used this one, and I just chose to do four out of ten, so eating 40% of the cake. Ah, so you just said four out of ten and 40%. So, folks, what we have here are four representations. And to take us back to the same but different um, routine that we started with, I want everyone to try and connect these. So in the chat box, you're going to type, but don't hit enter yet. What is the same about any two of them, three of them, four of them, but what's different about them? And if you can refer them by color of the outline, we have the red, the orange, the yellow, and the blue. Um, and just give a statement in the chat box about your noticings. We'll hit enter at the same time.
All right, and no worries if you type in a little soon, that's okay. Our first set of waterfalls can come in, but please keep typing if you have more things that you're noticing. Uh, Julia, you bring up one of the things that I was hoping we could discuss. Tell us about denominators and how you see them here. Uh, I was just impressed because in my head I just thought of 10 because I was also just thinking of percentages, but then everyone else was able to use different denominators and some using bigger denominators than 10 to get closer to 50%. Closer to 50%. That's a neat thing we're going to keep talking about in a minute here. Absolutely. So, um, Naomi mentioned something when we were in a small group that I thought was kind of clever, and I'd like us to make a connection to that. Um, Naomi, can you tell us what you discovered about the numerators and the denominators? Um, all of the numerators are less than half of the denominator in each case. So that's also a way for me to know that the, um, the model is showing um, less than a half. Ah. All right, so let's see if we can make some sense of that. Um, our question is, what is the numerator? And in the chat, you can write like the red one, the numerator is 85, it's not 85. Um, in the blue, the numerator is 78, it's not 78. Go ahead in the chat box, what numerators can you find out there? In the red, the orange, the yellow, and the blue, what's the numerator? And feel free to hit enter at any time. And Cindy, you mentioned the numerator is the one on top, but can I ask you how you see the numerator in the red model? It would be three. No, it would be one because they're using negative space. So three fourths of the cake is left. So in, in what's left, three is the numerator in what the eight one would be the numerator. Ah, so there's almost like this hidden number that could also be a numerator. Yes. Very cool. All right, we're getting some some good responses in here. What I'm doing is just checking for understanding in the chat box that people are seeing what those numerators are. I might also ask students to kind of bring out more ideas and, and share more about like what they saw. Um, Stephanie, I noticed that your response is a little different from others, but I agree with you. Why do you think blue has a numerator of 40? So there are I mean, it depends. Well, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. It depends on if it's red or yellow. The way that I got 40 was that there's 10 pieces. And I know that that's 10 just looking at it because I'm very familiar with tens frames. And so and I know there's 10. And so there's four yellow circles out of 10. And I know that equals four tenths. Um, and if I were to make it into an equivalent fraction, it would be like 40 hundredths. So four out of 10 which is four tenths. Neat. And then you also brought up some other representations. All right, so one thing I really wanna focus on here is this idea that Naomi brought up with numerators and denominators. So come on down to slide 25. Let's make some connections here. Somebody wrote on slide 25, Anything in the orange area is less than one half if it's less than 30 over 60. Would you type in the chat box, what fraction could the orange be? What fraction could the orange be? Uh, Miranda, you bring up a really neat one, one out of 30 or one thirtieth. How do you see that in this uh, image? Well, 
it could be anything less than that. So I'd see that just after the zero, a little bit more than the zero. Oh, so you actually looked at that space. How cool. All righty. Um, and then there's this lovely table. What I want to know is how this table relates to what Naomi had said. Naomi's idea. If you're the creator of this table, would you tell us why did you make this and what are you starting to think here? Let's see, it looks like group four, someone was making this table. I am in group four, but I wasn't the creator of the table. I'm just, I just want to make sure whoever created it is still here to speak. And if not, I'm happy to. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I'm having microphone issues, I think. Oh, we Hello? can hear you. Yep, we can hear you, Gail. Oh, okay. So I need the table um, is fractions with, because it was easier to do fractions in a table. And I started actually with the 50ths because I wanted to have a large number of pieces and took half of 50, said that's 25, so 24 below would be less than half the cake. And then I actually moved to the left when I made the table and I was looking at the numerators and denominators and some of those numbers we could put fours for four ninths and four four tenths. And then when we moved to sevenths and eighths, we had to change the numerators. But we could still have threes. And I just thought that was interesting. If you see a connection to what Naomi had said with Gail's table, um, go ahead and you can raise a hand if you want me to call on you. You can just turn on your microphone if you prefer. I'm wondering why there's two fours and two threes and two twos. Like, what's going on there? Why doesn't it go like five, four, three, two, one? Hmm. Yeah, Sue, go ahead. So I, ha I had a little bit more time to think about this table because I was in Gail's group. But I think that we're getting this doubles in those numerators when the denominators are either even or odd. So they sort of come in pairs. So two-fifths or two-sixths. Six is an even denominator. And so our rule to create a fraction less than one-half was just to say th three six would be one half, so take one away. But the rule when the denominator was odd, such as in five, was different. Half of five would be 2.5, which we could say it'd be kind of complex, but we just sort of lop, lop off that remainder. And so when you have paired consecutive integers, one being odd, one being even, then you have the same numerators on top. Did that make sense? Very cool. And that might be something that um, our our class would kind of talk more about in the next class. Um, that's a really big kind of mathematical idea connecting to the evens and odds there. Um, but still a really neat pattern we see on the table. Um, and still further, um, uh, as kind of the exit ticket for this conversation. So we've talked a little bit about numerators and denominators. I'm gonna ask the whole class to come to slide 26. And if you would double click in your assigned color, well, spoiler alert, you guys don't have assigned colors, but my students do, so they have a little order here. Um, double click in there. What fraction do you think is represented on this slide? You're gonna use a little estimation and some knowledge about numerators and denominators. What fraction do you think is represented on this slide? And then as the final part, 
of this exit ticket, if you would uh, use a comma after your initial response and give me a fraction, what is the largest piece that Saeed could cut? I'm being ambiguous on purpose, have fun with it. And now what I can do with these is get kids ready for the next class and the next conversation. Um, I notice that there are some people who are talking about limits and infinity, so I might put them together in a group. I might put the 49s out of 100s over in another group. Um, and I can just kind of separate students um, based on if I want them in homogenous groups or heterogeneous groups, um, just real quickly from that. And it's not a lot of extra planning for me. And I know that they're you know, either thinking similarly or differently in their small groups. So folks, the major questions I was looking to ask in this lesson today are on slide 28. I wanted students to think about numerators and denominators and the idea of what does bigger mean. Um, and this idea that the closer our numerator is to the denominator um, in, in the sense of being under one half, the closer it is to being one half. Um, and I think that's a really important mathematical message to get across at many different ages. Um, this is the end of our session. I'll stay on for anyone who has any other questions about the tech, the mathematics, and more. But I do have frequently asked questions on slide 29 if you're curious about some of the things that I did. Um, if you would like to type your questions on slide 31, I'll take them there. Or you can just turn on your mics and uh, ask them. If you'd like to see another topic presented in the future, um, go ahead and pop that in the table on slide 31. Let me know who it is also so I can get in touch with you and just make sure that you're planning to attend that time. Um, and if I have any other questions, I can uh, get in touch there. Um, but what topics do you teach? What lesson would you like to have prepared so you have one less thing to do um, in, in teaching online? And as always, it's been a pleasure to work with you all, and I'll stay after for anyone who wants to chat more. Uh, but thanks for coming, and happy Mather Days. Uh, somebody said directions for the knowledge hook manipulatives. You may have noticed uh, there were several manipulatives that were created by Andrew Fenner. He is a web developer for knowledge hook. That was the middle three. They had that kind of sky blue background. I'm gonna get in touch with them because several people say that they want kind of tutorials for how to use the tools. Um, but the cool thing is, is he is a web developer who takes our ideas in the math ed world and programs them. So if you have an idea about how to use these tools, um, definitely uh, let me know, let Andrew know. I'm gonna put his Twitter handle on here so you can follow him also. Um, but it's really cool that we know somebody who can make this happen. So let me get his Twitter handle for you all. It's at number shapes. There it is. All right, um, how do you encourage discussion at breakout rooms instead of students working on their own in the groups? That's a really great question. Um, when students are in breakout rooms, prior to this lesson happening, we would have done a variety of um, exercises to promote conversation in breakout rooms. One of the uh, top ones that I would um, bring out is um, just having a pair share for two minutes. So kids are together for only two minutes. They need to quickly talk about something because they know you're gonna return them to the main room. There's something neat about this feeling of urgency, but 
kids don't really bring out the stress of that. That, that sounds way more stressful than I intend it to. Um, with just two minutes, they have to start talking right away. And I get them doing that multiple times so they start to realize that that's part of the, um, the routine. If they're going into math groups um, and they're going to be working for 20 minutes, I'll typically have a mayor. And that mayor's job is to make sure that like everybody is talking. Um, the other thing I do is I myself jump into the multiple breakout rooms. Collaborate lets me see whose microphone is active when you all are in breakout rooms um, and who's quiet. So I typically go into quiet rooms first and lead the conversation, get it started. Um, but once students start to realize that that's the expectation through um, the other activities, then it, it goes a lot smoother. And what I'll do is I'll provide you with a couple templates that are useful um, to get kids used to that. And I'll just put them right above our virtual parking lot. Our first one is the breakout room phases. This is just kind of a guidance of how I decide and know when kids are ready for breakout rooms um, and what size groups to send them in and for how long. Um, I, it's a gradual release process. And then the other one are the um, jobs. Small group roles. Uh, slide 31 are the, or 32 are the small group roles that I typically use. Um, the mayor is a really important role and kids love doing that one because they often feel like they don't have to do a whole lot, but then they realize that actually they are the glue that keeps the conversation together. Um, let's see, what other questions uh, did you have here? Um, yeah, someone else brought up other roles. Somebody mentioned um, that you have the same challenge with students typing in the text box versus using the microphone. Um, and so I'll give you a little background on me. I was a computer gamer, like a really big gamer before I got into really education. Um, and there are certain kind of norms that kids develop about gaming, such as when to use the microphone and when to use the chat. So if you were in um, this raid where you have 50 people and you're all battling this monster, that's a lot of people. And you would not, it would not be considered netiquette to use your microphone to say, hey, how do, like, let's move over here, because you're talking to 50 people in a very important time. So kids have this natural ability to develop when they use the chat box, the text box, and when they use the microphone. Um, and so if you show that you value both, but you're also very purposeful about we're going to use the microphone right now because you're in a group of four. Um, that can be really useful for students and in, in making their online identities also. Um, but part of it is just kind of embracing that different people like to communicate different ways. I'm a chat box person, so I can relate to that one. Um, clip our images for students who don't have paper at home. Um, so it, do, do the virtual manipulatives work? One of the things that the virtual manipulatives that I brought up today um, do the fraction circles. Um, is it will actually allow you to, you know, make 60 pieces or, or make 74, 84 pieces. And then you can, um, you know, take a screenshot of that and bring it in. Um, so I find this app to be super useful in that um, it gives kids equal parts when they need it. Um, and typically I'll do things like trace your monitor at home, like on paper if you need to, but if you mentioned they don't have paper, I would definitely use more virtual manipulatives. Um, feel free to turn on your mics. If I didn't answer a question, you have more, let me know. Um, if you have other questions, let me know. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. 
how much how much time did you spend setting up all of these um norms for using all of these things like all of the virtual manipulatives and jumping on a doc at the same time and editing the exact same doc because I would love to do this with my kids but I know that these things take time as I've tried doing it with them before and getting them used to like not deleting each other's work and things like that but also, my math block while we're remote teaching is 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely something I struggle with. Sarah, what grade do you teach? Fifth. Fifth grade. Um, I ask it just because there's a, a variety of hand-eye coordination things with the youngest crew that uh, take into account. Um, so with fifth graders, one of the things that I like to do is just a little bit each day. Um, so if you're all if you already have a routine um don't try to change it all drastically instead the um you know if you're going to be doing um a a, a math routine at the beginning use that time to teach them the new tech so if they are learning how to screenshot something that's one of the first lessons i'll do um i'll let's say give them a link to a website i'll say make something here and then paste it or even before that, if you're moving between Google Slides and your teleconferencing tool, I'll tell them to type their name in the chat box, then go over to the Google Slides. There might just be one slide here. Just got to make it easy for the first time. They literally will type their name on the Google Slide, and then they'll come back into the teleconferencing tool and type finished um, right here in the, the conferencing tool. So I got this check that they can move back and forth. Um, Another thing that I do is I talk about making mistakes, um, a lesson on, you know, making sure everyone knows how to delete, move, or change something on the slide and how to press control Z uh, to undo their mistakes. But the important thing is much like everything else we teach, we kind of do this gradual release. Um, we teach them one small thing at a time uh, and constantly build on those. Um, so moving between the slides is, is an early lesson. Learning to copy and paste on a slide is a lesson. Learning to make mistakes and how to undo it is a lesson. Um, those lessons might only take five minutes, um, but uh, when you get the hang of those, it can just drastically change things. I see that, Stephanie. Do you wanna chime in? What do you teach now, Stephanie? So I teach third grade um, and at a Title I school. And so my school isn't as blessed with technology. Um, and since the uh, pandemic, thankfully, we've gotten more reliable technology. So I really started off like really, really slow. Um, and I am very, very thankful for Dr. Wells' TDs over the summer, definitely helped a lot. Um, but really starting slow and like I, like I use Google Classroom um and i like even though we are in january like i still model every day um how to get to google classroom how to get to our assignments um so i would choose like one thing that you want to try and just work it slowly like i um was trying to help with my math block and get like you know centers games you know things like that so because i feel like i was constantly talking um and so in blackboard students can move themselves into the breakout group. So like I kind of mentioned in the chat, you know, I showed them how to do it, show them where the door is, you know, um, and they were they were successful. Um, definitely a lot of trial and error. So it's OK to get frustrated because um, we're and I, I constantly remind the students like it's OK. Like one time someone deleted my whole slide deck and I forgot to make a copy. I'm like, we're just going to press the undo button, you know, um, so it's very, very taking a lot of patience with yourself as well as the students and just modeling like you wouldn't if you were in person. So Sarah, yeah, I realize that's I'm, so much you. easier said than done, but I also, um, I, I um, would advise if, you know, if Stephanie has some ideas at work, um, get together, share your, your contact information. And it's, it's making those networks reaching out to someone and be like, what was the tech lesson you did today? I'm out of ideas. And then I'll get a new idea from somebody else because when we're kind of alone, that is a really tough space to be in. Um, when you have others uh, that you can connect to, it can make it so much easier. 
Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. And thank you, Stephanie, for sharing. Um, Sarah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am I do not have my own class this year, but I'm constantly in K-12 classes, um, you know, observing or being a part of it or doing a, a lesson. Um, and so while I don't have my own students every single day, I pop into classes a lot. Sure thing. I'm excited to see our new topics. I'm going to pick right from this list for the next couple of weeks. So folks, have a wonderful Saturday.